Well, COVID has brought back into focus the relationship between public health and the physical environment in a way that perhaps we've lost sight of. Um, and of course, that puts a premium on what designers, all those design professionals, be they architects, engineers, planners, or whoever, uh, can do to improve the uh, physical environment uh, for uh, health and health management. Now, we're all familiar with terms like social distancing. We're all familiar with how circulation routes have to be quite carefully defined. And these, of course, are spatial manifestations of health priorities. And this is going to be the subject of this session, which is uh, part of uh, a, a sequence called Think Space, uh, which is an interdisciplinary forum created at University College London between the Barclay School of Architecture and the Slade School of Fine Art, uh, draw, which is specifically a vehicle to, to uh, take a multidisciplinary approach to critical issues of the time. And I'm delighted that uh, one of the members of the advisory group uh, Professor Nick Tyler uh, will be one of our speakers today. Uh, but th this relationship between the physical environment and health has very deep roots, very long historic roots. It certainly goes back, if not before, to the point where design and art were really the only available uh, provision of, of, of health care. And we can see that uh, in the Middle Ages when uh, leper hospitals were located outside the city walls or outside the town walls in order to socially distance people who are ill from people who are healthy. Um, and then, of course, more, moving more into the use of art in healthcare, we have projects like the Spedale uh, uh, di Santa Maria della Scala in Siena uh, at, or the Hotel Dieu in Bonn in France, uh, both of which date from the early 15th century where some of the finest stars of the time was created specifically to prepare the patients uh, for, for health and, and then very often for, for, for death, to help them to reconcile themselves to what their physical condition uh, was. Now, the relationship between the physical environment and health, of course, gets an enormous boost in the 19th century. Um, for many reasons, but one of them is uh, the physician John Snow discovering the connection between cholera and water, which he showed, I think, by statistical analysis, or what would now be thought of as statistical analysis, that uh, one particular pump in the London district of Soho uh, was responsible for an enormous number of cholera infections, and therefore sorting out the water supply could have an enormous benefit on public health. And then that led uh, by a uh, sort of fairly complicated route to the formation in 1855 of the Metropolitan Board of Works, whose principal um, task, certainly in their uh, first phase of existence, was to create the embankment running along the Thames, so that the sewage, which had previously gone directly into the Thames and thereby caused a massive public health problem, could be enclosed in its own dedicated channels. Uh, which still work today. Uh, and then, of course, the, uh, the, the, the whole notion of uh, overcrowding uh, and the uh, need to uh, improve public housing or ha provide some form of public housing uh, was also part of this same recognition of the relationship between health and the physical environment. Now, uh, it was also, at the same time, recognised that the middle class are prepared to pay tax um, for, for not many things, but sorting out health was one thing that did prove uh, possible to levy taxes and even to win elections on. So what that led to, in the UK at least, was what uh, town planning there was uh, became part of the prerogative of the Ministry of Health. And that really cemented this relationship between the physical environment and, and health. And that lasted until 1942, when town and country planning was given its own ministry. Now, that ministry was created largely for economic reasons, um, because in reaction to what had happened in the 1930s, uh, it was it, one of its import, most important tasks was to try to match centres of population to centres of employment. And that was seen to be uh, uh, only achievable with some form of state intervention. Um, and of course, more or less at the same time, slightly later, 
uh, the Ministry of Health had to take on responsibility for creating and then managing the National Health Service. And what that did was to drive a wedge between, at least in a governmental circles, between the physical environment and public health, which is now being thrown back into uh, sharp focus. Uh, and I think that's, as I say, the uh, uh, principal uh, sort of subject that we're going to look at now. Um, there have been intermittent attempts, it's certainly true, to uh, try to uh, reintegrate uh, uh, design and public health in the design of hospitals and other uh, such initiatives. Uh, but I still think it's, it's fair to say that there, there has been until recently a, a wedge uh, between them. Uh, and so I, I just want to introduce briefly our three speakers who will cover very different aspects of this. Our first speaker is Sandy Nairn, who is a writer and curator, formerly director of the National Portrait Gallery in London. Um, and perhaps more, most uh, relevantly for our purposes now, he is the chair of the art committee for the uh, Maggie's Cancer Charity, uh, which, as many of you will know, provides innovative design and indeed art uh, in support of its uh, work, which is basically uh, sort of helping to support uh, uh, patients and their families uh, with uh, cancer. Um, and uh, our second speaker will be Alison Pollock, who is director of Newcastle University's Centre for Excellence in Regulatory Science. That sounds like a very relevant title uh, now. Uh, and she is going to outline, I think, what designers can offer to health professionals, what that relationship between health professionals and design professionals could be and how that may improve uh, both the physical environment and health outcomes. And our final speaker is Professor Nick Tyler, who is, again, very appropriately, the Chadwick Professor of Civil Engineering at University College London. Uh, and uh, Chadwick is Edwin Chadwick, who was one of the pioneers of public health um, in the 19th century. Nick's particular specialism is in transport and, and perhaps more specifically, how people move in space, the configuration, a movement, and how barriers can um, uh, affect that. So each of our speakers will speak in, in, in that order for between 10 and 15 minutes, and then we'll have a discussion between the four of us at the end. So Sandy, may I ask if you could start? Jeremy. Thank you very much, and I'm delighted to have the chance to just say a few words, really, about Maggie's Cancer Care Centres. Um, if I can have the first slide. Um, what we're seeing here is the Maggie's Centre at the General Western Hospital in Edinburgh. And this is now 25 years ago that the landscape architect and designer Maggie Keswick, herself um, having breast cancer and finding that the clinical treatment at Edinburgh Hospital was very good, but that everything else around it, the information, the support, the sense of how to help her and her family deal with the impact of cancer, simply wasn't there. So she came up with a very simple idea, which was to say, could we make places alongside departments of oncology in different hospitals and make, if you like, these pavilion as they've emerged, pavilion type buildings where anybody could come and get support. So Richard Murphy was the designer of, in fact, a converted stable building. Uh, it's just been extended. And what you're seeing here is a rather wonderful sculpture by George Rickey. Um, because for Maggie and indeed, crucially for her husband, Charles Jenks, the way of inviting architects also had with it invitations to artists to contribute. If we can have the next slide. And perhaps the most uh, famous of the Maggie's buildings that have emerged, there are now more than 20 Maggie's centres across the United Kingdom and one or two in other parts of the world. Um, this building by Frank Geary and the sculpture by Anthony Gormley perhaps epitomises an invitation to make a place that in some ways feels special from the very beginning. As anybody arrives, they realise this is not a standard National Health Service building. And Gormley's, Anthony's rather sentinel-like figure acts as a rather wonderful marker in the landscape there um, of why, again, you might think about where you've arrived. You're probably very nervous if you haven't been there before. And the point really, let's have the next slide. Um, the point about the centres is to make places of welcome. 
Um, this is just a partial view, very partial view of Norman Foster's building for the Maggies, Manchester. And there's a one end you can see here, um, a rather sort of conservatory like uh, element that Norman designed to make the garden and the relationship of the garden come into the building and the building go out perhaps towards the garden. Um, and in the other slide, you can see a print by Bridget Riley. And in the discussions about how with Norman Foster, how could we make the building feel as welcoming and alive as possible? Um, the idea to bring a set of suite of prints by Bridget Riley became part of the discussions. There's also collaboration with Whitworth Art Gallery. Some of their collection is on show. But more than anything, a Maggie Centre needs to feel somewhere where anybody can walk in and somebody is attentive and somebody is offering the chance for someone to talk about what they're dealing with, to get help and support. So they need to be, if you like, domestic buildings rather than feel like clinical buildings. They don't have equipment. They're not having to deal with the technology that goes with that. So if you like, that's an advantage. Let's have the next slide. Um, and in the next one, we can see one of the earlier ones, too. This is Richard Rogers's uh, Maggie's West London. And you can see in the part of that image, not only Richard's beautiful building, a beautiful garden around it, but also a, a consulting room, a quiet room, and works by the artist Eduardo Paolozzi. Um, Paolozzi was a very good friend of Maggie Keswick. Maggie sadly did not survive. She was in remission for some time, then the breast cancer came back. And Charles Jenks, while Charles was alive and sadly no longer with us, Charles was an inspiring force in working with artists and architects and designers to think about how the, each of these centers could feel a very particular place. Um, and Eduardo Palazzi, uh, his estate after Eduardo had died, helped in his collaboration by offering work. So many of the Maggie centers have Palazzi pieces. And you can see there's a whole group of little Palazzi sculptures on the back wall there. Uh, let's have the next one. Um, here's a more recent building, Maggie's Oldham. Uh, by DRMM uh, and uh, for them they've made a building really surrounding trees. The trees are really the centre of the space and then the building's designed around the trees. This is often the Maggie's uh, centre way that the gardens and the planting becomes a crucial part of how the place will feel. And in many centres we've managed to create uh, working relationships with collections nearby and in this case with uh, Oldham Art Gallery quite conventional works on loan. It's a very beautiful, perhaps unconventional building. Uh, but here you see a print by Julian Trevelyan, rather conventional print from some years ago, but nonetheless a very delightful counterpoint uh, to how the architecture works and the design works to give people a sense of support and comfort and really often dealing with nervousness and sometimes the need for distraction. People can need to feel that they can look at something that they can ask about something, that they can inquire about something, and that may be an important part of their relationship. Uh, let's have the next uh, slide. And the last one I wanted to, to show you was just, um, again, a relatively recent centre, Maggie's Cardiff by Dow Jones, on a very, very um, cramped and rather limited site. And so often the sites that are available alongside uh, health service hospitals are not extensive um, and what's needed is a cleverness uh, and uh, intricacy by the architects to find a way of making a building that will uh, complement and uh, make a place that people will want to come to. Um, and for Dow Jones they both had to make a building that was very close to a road and it's probably hard to see in the slide but there's actually a rather wonderful set of bollards uh, actually designed by Anthony Gormley and the bollards um, a, probably just a very, very everyday, ordinary thing to stop cars getting too close to the building. Um, but they're in a format uh, of uh, various shapes, uh, suggestive and otherwise, by Gormley, and uh, they become a sort of almost semi-humorous uh, element as you approach the building. And what may look like a rather stark exterior when you get inside in the Dow Jones building actually opens up into delightful and light spaces. One of the characteristics of each of the Maggie centres is to have a kitchen table so that when you enter and somebody will come very soon and say, can I help? 
Um, and the first invitation is to come to the kitchen table and to be offered a cup of tea. And that idea of a cup of tea, something absolutely everyday, ordinary, helpful and supportive is something that is, if you like, at the heart of a Maggie Centre. There's also a very nice little point that that you won't find any signs on the doors. Um, you may need to ask where the toilet is, but there isn't going to be a sign on the door saying toilet. In other words, the things are done to create interiors that are not institutionalized, deliberately left, sometimes rather random in the furnishings, in the, whether that's the rugs, whether that's the cushions. And actually what's delightful here is that we approach the National Museum of Wales and they were very happy to lend um, some wonderful paintings. You can see there's a large painting, it's hard to see probably on the slide, but there's a large painting by Marley Morris uh, in that tall uh, interior by Dow Jones. Um, and for the National Museum of Wales, questions of well-being and health are central to all their work. It's an explicit part of what the National Museums in Wales are doing, of thinking how can they contribute to a public agenda of well-being. So having the opportunity to collaborate with Maggie's Cancer Care Centres was actually they were very happy to pick up the opportunity and we were very happy to make that collaboration. And then finally I wanted to, with my last slide, um, just to represent something about the strength of the, the relationship. This year amidst Covid uh, for Maggie's Centres uh, initially not being able to open then offering, of course, online services, uh, the sense that cancer patients inevitably, but sometimes with great distress, were being set aside in favour of the emergency treatment for COVID patients. Um, all of that made the demand on Maggie's even greater. And yet the ability of every Maggie's centre to raise money, but because they are all independently funded as a charity, there's no government support to run them meant that funds had to be raised. So part of this year has involved working with artists. And this is a very, very beautiful print produced by uh, Sir Anish Kapoor, uh, precisely for the 25th anniversary of Maggie's and in order to raise funds and it's on offer at the moment. And it's there as a representative, if you like, for me, a symbol of that collaboration for Anish Kapoor to donate a print was something he felt was very important in the spirit of Maggie's. So I think just to finish, it's a sense for me of everyday, everyday caring and kindness and the way that art can work with designers and architects and landscape designers to create beautiful and supportive places. Thank you. Well, uh, Sandy, thank you very much for a concise but very uh, informative and engaging uh, description of how design and art work in the particular context of the Maggie Centres. And it seems to me to be an extraordinary achievement where the particular knowledge and enthusiasms of uh, Maggie and uh, Charles came together to create something that transcends themselves and, and, and them as a couple and as, as a family into something of real general benefit. And I think that that was achieved not just through their vision, but through the people who have worked on it, such as Sandy and his colleagues in the art committee, Laura Lee, the director, uh, and of course the various architects and artists who have worked on individual works uh, for the, the, the centres. Um, now I'm going to turn to Alison Pollock, who, as I said earlier, is a director of Newcastle University's Centre for Excellence in Regulatory Science, who is herself obviously a health practitioner. So, Alison, may I ask you to take over? Well, thank you. And thank you, Sandy, for that inspiring talk. I only wish that the inspiration that was driving what was happening in cancer was spreading throughout not just our hospitals, but also into social care and especially into nursing homes and residential care homes, because they are actually a population that probably need it more than anyone else. So um, without more ado, yes, you're absolutely right. COVID has cast um, a spotlight, not just on the inequalities, which have been magnified by COVID and the injustices, but also um, how the way in which um, We've stopped thinking enough about physical space and physical design. Um, uh, 
and actually the obstacles and barriers to that, which I'm going to actually cover um, in a little in a little bit of detail. Um, next slide, please. So these six principles, and I can't see these slides, so I'm going to put my own up in a minute. Um, the six principles of um, building design were natural ventilation, natural daylight and view, clean water and sanitation, landscape building configuration, site planning, the conservation of historic resources, and last of all, local building um, materials and self-sufficiency. And uh, of course, these principles have been in effect for quite a long time. And you can see in the relationship um, between the clinical um, need and um, especially in the 19th century, where you had the great debates on miasma versus germ theory of disease that Jeremy's referred to earlier. And um, of course, we didn't have antibiotics, not until very late into the 20th century, 1940s, 1950s. And so we were very dependent um, on the, uh, the, the, um, germ, the miasma theory. And that influenced, um, it, that influenced, had a great influence on building design. Um, next slide, please. So some of the big key influences um, which have been touched upon were Flor Florence Nightingale and her famous notes on hospitals, which I recommend to you, where she worked with lots of other people on thinking about building and ward design. And that, of course, the Nightingale wards became highly influential right throughout the world, where careful attention was given to ventilation because it was well understood um, in the absence of having antibiotics and uh, having a way of conquering germs, the importance of good spacing, light and ventilation. So you'll all be familiar with the long wards, 28, 30 feet wide by 128 feet long, and the pavilions and the verandas. And then that was very influential in, de, in the model of, and, and indeed I worked in many of those hospitals with the long Nightingale wards. Um, but then of course we had in the 1950s, the Nuffield Provincial Trust who were very, very influential in thinking about hospital design. So much so that the Chief Medical Officer for Health Sir George Godber, who was one of the architects of the NHS, included a chapter in his annual report in the 1960s, 1960, on hospital design. We don't see that in any chief medical officer reports today. But he was very, um, he was, there was a great preoccupation with hospital design because in 1948, we had the birth of the NHS. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Then we had the hospital plan of 1962 under Enoch Powell, which was never completed. This was the big hospital building program. And only a third of hospitals were ever finished because the government always refused to make enough money available. It's interesting, that's been the history of our health service, the lack of capital, actually all of our public services, although they can find a hundred billion pounds for Operation Windshot and testing today. So we know these as political decisions. But at that time, when they put in the NHS estate uh, hospital plan, they needed to have architect departments. And so architects were actually being employed in house to come up with designs. And I hope some of you are architectural historians and can help illuminate this. The 1974 and the IMF crisis, David Owen said we had to stop the hospital building program and it virtually ceased with very few hospitals being built. Um, then we had the internal market, where really from 1990 onwards, architects were largely the department was lost. And we got the creation of NHS estates, an arm's length agency, and then the inauguration of PFI and Hub, where we had enormous outsourcing of all the specialties. So we lost our in-house skills and we started to go much more global with global large banks and equity investors, and I'll come back to that one. Next slide. I think it's worth reminding everybody um, that uh, 
Next slide, please. The birth of the NHS. Um, I don't know if uh, the NHS was built, um, came out of the war, as you all know. Um, and it was designed to give people freedom from fear. For the first time, they wouldn't have to worry about healthcare bills. And it was very important, but it also had some very important principles. So if you go back to the previous slide, and the principles were public funding, public and community ownership, importantly, public and community accountability, and of course, public provision and delivery. All of those principles have been eroded, uh, culminating in the 2012 Act. So next slide, if you can go to the slide after the slide with Bevan, and this is a slide of what's been happening to hospital beds, and it tells a really important uh, story. So in 1948, the NHS, basically all the municipal hospitals, the voluntary hospitals were nationalized and they had been as part of the emergency uh, health service that was created in 1938 to deal with the uh, start of war. So the NHS was a weird assortment of hutments, add-ons, um, and of course, a very old estate, much of it more than a hundred years old. And the NHS at the outset had 450,000 beds. That's a huge number of beds. And what you can see in this chart, I don't know if you can all see it, but you can see the enormous decrease in beds on the left-hand side, the blue, the yellow, and the red falling. And we now have today, and our population has probably almost doubled, we have fewer than 100,000 general and acute beds, 120,000 beds in all. So we've lost almost three quarters of our beds. So we've seen huge hospital closure, hospital disposal programs. But what's happened is that the beds that once housed older people, people with dementia, psychogeriatric mental health, have largely been shifted into the private sphere and privately funded as well. So this dotted line that you see going up to the top um, are, is the private sector beds. So it went from virtually very, very few private sector beds in 1948, almost none, to the fact that we've got 400 450,000-odd beds now in residential and nursing care homes. Most of them would once have been in the NHS. And most of them are owned by large corporate chains and multinationals, equity investors where their sole interest is increasingly the extraction of rent from them. And many of you will have been into these nursing and residential care homes and you'll have seen, uh, despite all the staff efforts, they're nothing like the Maggie centres. They're actually a stain on our conscience. Um, the best design is uh, the, with the movement of um, people wanting their own rooms, and own bathrooms, they're more like travel lodges in many instances, and so too are the new hospitals that have been built. Next slide, please. This again shows you what happened to local authority provision. Local authority had a lot of um, residential care beds and nursing home beds. They've sold them off, sometimes for a penny a go for a home. Um, that's the blue line in the chart. And instead you can see the huge replacement by large mainly for profit corporations. The UK has privatized most, much more than the US, its nursing and residential care and put much more into the hands of large for-profit corporations. So this is the story that needs to be told, the loss of public ownership, public control, public funding, because of course, people who go into private nursing and residential care homes must pay uh, until they are too poor to pay, so they're on spend down. They must also pay for many elements of their care, including physio, etc. So it, this, is a, uh, this is an important part of the story because actually basically what's happened is huge swathes of health and social care have moved out of the public domain. They've been privatized, they're in the private sphere, and so there is no real public accountability or public democracy. And the interesting thing about the rise of the Nightingale homes is of course they, that was happening before suffrage, when the war memorial hospitals were being built by public subscription or genuine 
local philanthropy, not the global corporate philanthropy that we're seeing today, um, which actually is attempting to trump democracy rather than preceding democracy. Next slide, please. So what we have now, which is a real problem for us all to wrestle with, is what is the estate strategy? And I've already mentioned that what's happened is the government has largely privatized. It's got two Department of Health owned companies uh, for NHS estates. And their main business is land disposal and sell off of land and also rent extraction, charging market rents to the hospitals. Because what's happened to our hospitals since 1990 is they became body corporates, they had to break even and then make surpluses. Um, and um, the, they have to pay a charge on their capital to, uh, to the treasury, but increasingly there's rent extraction going on on every bit of public, uh, uh, the public buildings now. And this is having a devastating effect on GP practices, on hospitals throughout the country, but the main source of rent extraction, of course, is the private finance initiative, which Alan Milburn described as the biggest hospital building program in the 1990s, but which in effect was the biggest hospital closure program. It usually resulted in selling off three hospitals and downsizing them into one, selling off the land, all the lovely physical space that was there, uh, gentrification and moving it into out of town sites, which were difficult to access, but where of course more rent extraction could happen through car parking and car parking charges. These hospitals were built, unlike the war memorial hospitals and the philanthropy hospital, philanthropic ones, not on the basis of what the public wanted or public need. Indeed, there were huge campaigns against the PFI and there were huge campaigns against the closure of hospitals that was not all sentimental at all because the pub couple re public realized what they were losing as their hospitals were becoming uncoupled from their from their local communities and as part of that uncoupling we had the hospital trusts as i said that were created in 1990 uh, that were given more and more powers and more and more freedoms and then you had hospital trust mergers which were another way code for closing hospital sites, for centralizing uh, under the banner of improving care and centralization for which there was little or no evidence whatsoever, or under the banner of efficiency savings. But what we know is that you don't get efficiency savings when you're closing or going from three into one. But as well as all these hospitals that were closed, there was a huge closure of community hospitals, so Norfolk, and Norwich, Norfolk oversaw huge closure of small community hospitals that played a very important function. So this is what we are now up against. The loss of the public, PFI, we are simply sail and lease back, paying enormous rents um, for the period of 30 years and these contracts are being exp expanded to 60. And uh, next slide, please. This is the contract. Sorry. Um, so we've got real costs issues of a policy. I won't go through of the whole PFI issue, but uh, inflexibility of contracts. We saw deregulation of space standards. So you could hold your hands around the ward, as it were. So all that physical distancing went. The local access went, transport um, and trust mergers. So we've lost a huge amount. Next slide, please. So these are the six principles, and I think we should be asking about these six principles every time we look at a building or a building site. And I'll just remind you now to 1920s, the Dawson Report, which is a very influential report. It preceded the NHS, which had a vision for the public of provision of buildings and equipment, suitable, suitable for the community, coordination of both preventative and curative uh, medicine and freedom of action for doctors, staff and patients. Next slide, please. And he set out these principles and it's really worth looking at them because he integrated primary care, secondary care, tertiary care, cancer care, 
whatever you called it. Next slide, please. And this is a diagram. Okay, thank you. Next slide um, is taken. I don't know whether you can see uh, this slide. Um, I'm just going to go and look and see where I am on the screen. This was, you can't see this very well, but it's really worth going back to the report because he saw Dawson and the people who wrote the report with the architects had a real vision for their hospitals, their villages, their towns, and of where primary care should be located and community hospitals and the tertiary hospitals. So they very much saw this as part of the community and an integrated project, not standalone buildings, which if you've got a criticism, you might say of Maggie Center or the same for the primary healthcare centers, but truly integrated and truly part of their community, which is what we lost. The district general hospitals were an extraordinary innovation because they were designed to give a hospital to a local community of around 150,000 people with many of the elements of the Dawson report there. But we've lost that with trust mergers and the corporate um, nature of what we have. Next slide, please. Here is a little bit more from the Dawson report, um, his vision again for primary care. Next slide. I'm sitting in Edinburgh. And here you can see the old Edinburgh Royal Infirmary, which closed and made way. It was in the centre of town, a great location. Um, you can see the pavilion wings. You can see the verandas, which looked out onto the meadows, which are still there. Tragically, this building, instead of being optimised and used properly, it had a lot of space around it. It could have been renovated, has now been turned into accommodation for very, very wealthy people where each flat can go up to two or three million pounds in, in this. So huge amounts of money made on the back of this. Next slide, please. And here you can see again, if you were sick, you were wheeled out to the veranda and you could look at the sheep grazing, the people walking by and the meadows are still there. But this is now the luxury view for those who can afford it, not those who need it. These were very well ventilated wards. There was a need for a lot of capital maintenance, but they weren't unpleasant places to work. Next slide, please. This is the replacement, some eight to 14 miles out of town in the middle of nowhere, built in an old mining area. Um, it's pretty ghastly when you walk into it. Many of the offices don't have natural light they look, uh, at all. Um, and it uh, has uh, been besieged with problems, this PFI. Difficult to reach uh, out of town and also um, car parking, which is now free thanks to the SNP, but wasn't for a long time. And I think we've lost a lot um, with these big PFI projects. The loss of local architects, the loss of lo local community, local resources. Um, and above all, the loss of sustainability and affordability, because we will be paying these charges for a long, long time to come. Next slide, please. So a lot of people have made a lot of money from this. Um, I'm ending with this quote uh, from PricewaterhouseCoopers. Um, and I think uh, the important thing to remind, remember is that these buildings are not owned and operated by the public sector, nor are they publicly accountable or under control. The risks are managed through a contract. And if you remember, the investment bank or insurance company is there simply to fulfill a temporary objective of the sponsoring firm. This is not about permanency and long-lasting durability for the population. So there are a lot of barriers to overcome. I'm going to finish because I've gone over time. But I think if we're really serious about this, uh, we need to think seriously about the role of architects and design, democracy, accountability, and uh, the system, as far as I'm concerned, is completely broken. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Alison, for that. I think you highlight some incredibly important points. I hope we'll have time to discuss them at the end. But in particular, I'd just like to draw attention to your uh, mention of the Dawson report, which, of course, came from the point where the Ministry of Health was not just overseeing healthcare provision, but also town planning. And that diagram of how you locate your healthcare facilities within an urban environment, I think, is 
is very striking. And I think it's probably something that will resonate with our next speaker, Nick Tyler. Can I ask you to take it away, Nick? Okay, well, thanks very much. Um, we can, I'm going to talk about a little bit following on from both of the previous uh, speakers by uh, romping through as quickly as I can the concept of actually how do we actually make places that heal in and of themselves so that in the end the need to go into hospital for treatment and so on reduces. So if you take the next slide, please. I mean, one of, one of the issues that, that drives me a lot is that um, um, the health issue is enormous. It's all about sus the, the survival of species. It's about how we live with a good quality of life and so on. But actually, what we're often chasing around here is something which is really, really tiny. And COVID would be a very good example. We've been working on uh, buses with Transport for London, and what we're chasing around is a sort of sub-micron particle um, and how that actually moves around the bus. The next slide, piece. So we have to try and face what that difference really means, um, how we actually um, deal with something like a, a virus moving around um, and that people actually have a part to play in that. And of course, it's about how they interact with the environment, um, how they interact with that bus, for example, or the space or the rooms that they're in, but also how they interact with each other. And this brings us into the whole issue around things like wearing face masks and how far apart people are and so on. And um, that then has to translate into the environment as to how do you actually manage to, to do this. And when you start to look at space in the environment, if you can take the next uh, slide. Um, when you start to look at space in the environment um, and how you actually manage that, that brings us into this sort of anthropologist Edward Hall's view around uh, what he called proxemics, which was essentially about how you figure out how far apart people are in society. So if you go to the next uh, slide, um, proxemics is about, um, as I say, it's about the dis it's, it's kind of studying proximity. And he came up with four kinds of space that, that related people's actions in space, uh, in public space, um, mostly through observations in New York in the 1960s. So if we go to the next slide, please. The first one of these is what he called social space. And social space um, is essentially around about up to about um, eight, nine, ten meters, maybe. Um, and that's where you can start to identify that there is a person there. You may you may know them. If you know them, you probably know who they are. If you didn't know them, you would be able to identify perhaps whether they are somebody you wish to encounter or would wish not to encounter, but you wouldn't know much more than that. Next slide, please. If you uh, move a little bit closer to somebody, you can start to recognize facial features. Um, you might be able to infer that they're a mood of some sort. You might infer they're smiling or they're scowling or something like that. And you may be able to start the process of responding to that. So you kind of acknowledge a little bit more that this is a person with whom you may or may not wish to um, encounter. Um, next slide. Um, in a closer space, up to around about um, one and a quarter meters, uh, this is a space in which you can have conversations. And that's where people would chat routinely. That was what they would, the kind of distances that they choose to chat in. Um, so we're getting closer and closer and you'll be, then now that encounter is actually a bit more verbal. If you go to the next slide, it shows the fourth space. And the fourth space is what he called intimate space. Uh, people that you admit into that space, unlike the others, they are kind of there. This one, you admit people into that space um, if they are, uh, familiar to you and, and you are happy with that kind of relationship. If they enter that space without that permission, that is an act of aggression. And just to put that in mind, um, the London Underground uh, pre-COVID was operating in peak hours at around, with around four and a half people per square meter. And at that distance, you are certainly in that aggressive space. Um, if you move on to the next slide, um, outcome of all of Edward Hall's work is that that has actually influenced urban design really pretty much ever since, but increasingly over the last 20 years or so, um, as architects like Jan Gale and others st strived to create space in the urban environment between the buildings that architects are often designing. Um, how do you actually manage that space so that people feel that it's a space which works with them? So the next slide, please. Um, and that begs the question, and this is kind of where we started working with all this, well, why is it that the proxemics uh, stuff works? 
So we started to look at it because there really wasn't very much. It was all about observation. So we started to look at it. I'm going to go very, very simply through this. If you take the next slide. We live in an environment. The environment um, emits information. Billions and billions and billions and billions of bits of information come out of the environment all the time. We are a, an amazing multi-sensorial sensor of that information. Um, it comes into us through our sensorial pathways, through our skin, through our ears, through our eyes, and nose, and so on. Um, we then process that um, in parts of the brain and then into the central brain that enables us to start perceiving what that information is actually telling us. The vast majority of that information actually is unknown to us consciously. We, we know tiny amount of the information that's come into it. There is a kind of decision process that says this is something you should know about and we become conscious of it. And that is a tiny proportion of all of that information that is actually happening. But both pre-conscious and conscious um, information actually drive action. And if you go to the next slide and the action then sends a feedback loop. We in acting change the environment. We might move, we might say something, we, we alter the environment through that. And then the whole cycle starts all over again. If you go to the next slide, um, this is a kind of representation of um, a person in those environments. So the next slide. Um, this is a kind of representation of what's actually happening there. So you start off at the bottom, you have an environment, that environment communicates into the person, the person responds by acting, that act creates another environment, and so that spiral goes on uh, throughout time. And if you go to the next slide, we can then think about, well, why is it, let's come back to Edward Hall, why are these spaces, particularly that chat space, why are these spaces actually working the way they do? Well. It's not just happenstance. It is not cultural. If you go to any country in the world, you will find the same spaces between people when they are having those kinds of conversations. What will be different is the way in which they greet and the way in which they ungreet each other. But the actual conversation space is actually remarkably simple, similar. And the reason for that is it's based on a lot of physiological things how the human voice works and how our ears work, both the ear of hearing the other person and the ear of hearing yourself. Uh, next slide. It also uh, relates to how our eyes take in information, how much you can see when somebody is at that distance will affect how many people you can relate to in that time. So you have conversational groups of four, but a fifth person arriving tends to find themselves on the edge and you it, that means that it doesn't work quite so well so groups of five tend to break into two of two groups of two and three next slide um how the skin senses breeze that's why the skin one of our, the largest organs in the body um actually senses breeze it's about how things are happening around you in that wider environment the next slide um how all of those senses then process this data um, because that's actually how we create those actions and the next slide and actually how quickly we do it. So we process, for example, sound and acoustic stimuli way faster than we, we process vision. Although we tend to think that vision is a very, very important sense for us and it is, but it's speed is, is problematic, particularly when you get into smaller spaces. So, um, that conversational space of, space of 1.2 meters, actually up to about 10 meters distance, you will be processing sound stimulus faster than you will be processing the same light stimulus. Musicians play by ear, not by eye. And um, if you go to the next um, slide, this is around how much of that data we're actually processing. Actually, the brain capacity for processing information is at around about 11 million bits per second and your conscious uh, capacity, the capacity of conscious processing is around 80 bits per second. And that is the difference between what's coming in and what you're actually consciously processing. But you are actually processing all the rest of it too. It's how you can walk along the road, have a conversation with somebody and not fall over. The next slide. So when we come to talk about the social distancing question um, or social spacing question, this is actually governed by time is governed by the time of processing 
stimuli such as a facial gesture, the sound of a voice, the stress of a voice or whatever, that is actually dictated by time. So it, it's a very sensible thing to start thinking about time. Um, give you an illustration, the next slide, please. If you have two people starting off at that eight, nine, 10 meters away, apart from each other, if they're walking towards each other, it takes about three or four seconds for them to actually encounter each other at the point where they could actually have a conversation or even just simply say hello to each other and be heard and responded to. And, and that is a really important issue because that kind of time limit is a kind of the time it takes the brain to aggregate stimuli to be able to make sense of them. Next slide. Um, time itself, um, I think, is a suretic process. It's a kind of process which has many, many different time, time periods and cycles going on at the same time, and they're all moving at different rates. And it's rather like this is a picture of uh, the, the river Amazon in Manaus in Brazil, where two parts of the river coming from two different sources with two different um, densities and temperatures of, of water do not mix for around about 20 kilometers. And as you go along, the boundary between these two rivers gradually merges together um, that's kind of how time works. And we need to understand how we process those different rates of time. Um, the next slide, please, is a sort of, sort of um, example of this. Um, the next slide, please. Um, this is just a sort of sense of, we are dealing with all of these times, all of the, all of the time. Um, whether they are natural phenomena that we're dealing with, like the weather, or like the way that the land is, or topology, or um, things like COVID. Um, natural phenomena move in rates of eons and things like that. As we come uh, into the shorter time scales that we're more uh, often thinking about, we move away from or we incorporate environmental time scales like years and things like that into more personal time scales. And there is an overlap between uh, between the two. So we can predict things maybe over years, but we can't really foresee things over a millennium, for example. When you get down to that far right end end of that, of that arrow, you're into the speed of processing of pre-conscious and conscious data and so on. So if you go to the next slide, please, it's in that far right hand age that we are dealing with the social uh, interactions between people. And therefore, when we start to think about the space that we need in order to encounter somebody in a civilized way, and what we might loosely call social space, the space in which that happens, and the kind of sociality that actually distinguishes Homo sapiens from other, um, other species is actually really important, but it's happening at that kind of timescale. So this is the kind of timescale that we need to design spaces for in order to encourage and permit and and allow relationships like that to blossom. If we go to the next slide, that, yep, that is a, a question of how we actually compress time. Um, if we compress time too much, if you try to move too far to the right end of that arrow, you're going to induce stress. Next slide. If you, if you similarly, if you start invoking processes which are very top down, if I choose how to design that space. I'm going to pressure people to have to perform in it. And that is another source of stress. Um, we sort of kind of squash people in it. The next slide. If you end up increasing stress by the spaces in which you're in expecting people to encounter, like the peak hour metro train, you're going to start creating ill health. If we go to the next slide. On the other hand, if we create a social space in which people can encounter in a relaxed environment, this is Havana, Cuba, um, where that space is controlled, if you like, by that bollard that the guy is leaning on, and that creates a set of social spaces where you find people encountering and having those kinds of conversations. We can look at a, the next slide. The next uh, is a is a, a set of seats in Nicosia bus station in the middle. Those seats are curved to enable people to have easier conversations if they wish to be social, or they can have privacy if they wish not to be by choosing whether they sit on one side or the other of the seat. If we go to the next slide, um, that's where the arts come in so importantly that, that uh, Sandy was talking about much earlier, because in a sense, the arts work on that pre-conscious level very, very much so, and as well as the conscious level that we are aware of. And if we bring in the person's um, history, their genetic history, but also their history of experience and so on, 
These are actually all about how we create those healthy responses. And if we go to the next slide, we can then see how we can create spaces in which those responses can be, can be done. This is a laboratory we're building at the moment where we can create life-size environments in which we can study exactly how those pre-conscious and conscious interactions actually happen. And so we can understand better how to create places that heal. Thank you very much. Nick, thank you uh, for a fascinating presentation. I think what we've had from our three speakers, a, a very powerful but uh, quite different uh, outlines of how the physical environment can and probably should contribute to our health, mental, social, as well as uh, physical. Um, I, we don't have very long for conversation, but I'd just like to start with a, a question, I think, first to, to Alison, which is uh, that I wonder the extent to which the enormous advances in pharmacology, starting in the 19th century with anesthetics and antiseptics, with, of course, accelerating massively with the range of drug treatments that are available now, has, to some extent, allowed health professionals to take their eyes off the importance of the built environment? That's um, several PhDs. Um, I, I, I'm not sure that I buy into that. I mean, I think the loss of... I mean, I, my challenge to you is where are the public architects? Where are the public design? Was there a battle to keep public architects as, a, you know, local authorities had them, municipalities had them. And why did the profession just allow themselves to be squeezed out? Um, or did you have no choice? Um, because uh, it, it seems to me that that's a really important element is, you know, where, where, are, the, where, are, the, where were the architects departments? And they would have had a, should have had enormous influence. And of course, we can see what happened as the government decided to outsource everything. But that I wonder, was there any kind of battle to stop outsourcing of public architecture and public space? I, I think there are several PhDs in, 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 in that one as well. Uh, but I think the point is well made. And I do think that the architectural profession bears some responsibility um, as well as quite often being confronted with an impossible uh, series of, of yeah. decisions that were taken on, you know, for it, that excluded it, um, in arguing the case for the importance of, of, of physical space. I think Nick, uh, as an as a, uh, urban designer, as an engineer, makes that case very well. But I wonder if I can ask Sandy very quickly, as someone who has uh, both worked in the art world, but has also commissioned works of architecture when you're at the National Portrait Gallery, how... Um, architects could be brought back into this sort of decision-making process? Well, I think what we've certainly seen in the cultural sphere, I would say, is architects playing a crucial place the renewal and revival of our museums over the last 10, 15 years has seen wonderful uh, interventions and collaborations with architects. And certainly when I think back to the competition to create Tate Modern um, and the young Hurt, partnership of Herzog and de Meuron. Um, and actually it's where Nick's points are very cogent about, that was a lot of discussion about space, um, even when we wildly underestimated how many people would come. It was designed for two million a year, and we found five million a year were coming. But nevertheless, the discussion was the same about space. So I think we've got some exemplars of where architects have, I think, been exemplary about helping make new cultural forms. And Nick, just very quickly, uh, how can the sort of uh, insights that you're developing through your research be fed into briefs for uh, public space and public buildings? I think, um, I think I would say we need to make sure we educate the clients um, because in the end, the clients, the, the architects are, are doing great stuff and urban designers are doing great stuff, but they are driven by a client and we need to get the clients educated in what is actually important and to involve much, much more around the communities that are involved in using these kinds of facilities or just simply enjoying them uh, in, in figuring out what the purpose is and how best to be able to get that purpose. But isn't Thank that you. part and I think this is something... Sorry, I just wanted yes. to say, isn't so, that so, part of the problem? It's a whole client mentality, the market mentality, that, you know, 
I, I mean, you know, as a doctor, I worked for the NHS, in the NHS, I was trained, salaried. Shouldn't architects also be trained, salaried and working within the public for and with the institution rather than seeing this client or handmaiden relationship as it is in the case of PFI? I mean, I, I'm sorry, well, I, I'm throwing I a think, huge... Well, Alison, but what, what this goes meaning, to the essence I, of what it is to be a professional, yeah. which is how do you serve the public interest? And, and that is what grants, or that is what justifies professionals, be they doctors, engineers, architects, or whatever, having some sort of status that separates them uh, from ev everyone else. I'm sorry we're out of time on this, because clearly we could go on for the rest of the afternoon. Uh, but thank you very much to Sandy, Alison, and Nick for a fascinating session. Thank you, Jeremy. Cheers. <laughs>